Welcome back. This week I want to focus on the influence that new technology can have on a persuasive campaign. But instead of really focusing on technology for technology's sake, I want to focus on the bigger functions. You know, why, why is social, tech, social media useful? How can it be useful? What are the tips and tricks to keep in mind? So we're not really focusing on individual technologies, but focusing on really a critical and practical perspective on why technology is an important part of building a persuasive campaign in today's day and age. So what I'll start with is an overview of technology and persuasion, and then we'll take a look at a great example of an integrated persuasive campaign. That's why I call this the non-geeks introduction to new technology. You're not going to learn how to use Twitter. Sorry. So let's, let's start with this basic question. What is new technology, new media? You know, we hear a lot of different terms for what this is. Web 2.0 might be familiar, but we hear about Facebook, blogging, YouTube, the blogosphere, heaven help us, Twitter, all of these kinds of things. To boil it down to the heart of it, new technology is about helping people connect directly. So before, if we think of movies, advertise, traditional advertising, um, journalism, there's always someone there giving us what we want, or giving us the message. New technology is about people taking a more active role. So any technology that lets people connect directly to one another without having to go through uh, the arbiter of, say, a journalist's viewpoint or anything like that. So the fact that we can, we can all post our updates, we can tell people where we are, what we're doing at any given point of the day, that's the new technology. It's about peer-to-peer -peer interaction. So we know that there's been an explosion of new media and new technology in the last five or six years. And there's a lot of potential associated with this. Howard Rheingold argues that we're really on the, the cusp of something genuine, authentic, and, and a social revolution. Here's the thing. Technology is neither good nor bad. It is inherently just a tool. So if people use these tools well, there is a lot of promise and a lot of opportunity to connect people in meaningful ways. You know, the, the internet in and of itself is a way that people can connect, can interact. So I agree with Rheingold as he says that we're living in a very exciting time. Yet, kind of the counterbalance to this point is that people have to be comfortable with the technologies themselves. Clay Shirky suggests that communication tools, new technology, for example, isn't interesting socially until the technology is kind of not, it, it loses its shine a little bit. What he's talking about here is that if people don't know how to use the technology, if it's so new and so cutting edge that like two people can use it, guess what? We're not going to be using it. It's not going to be helpful for designing a social campaign or designing any kind of, of messaging around because people won't use it. You know, if we think about the problems and the challenges with even conducting a survey online, not everyone knows how to download. Not everyone knows how to clink click. Not everyone has word. That's pretty basic, right? So until our technologies and our comfort with them evolve, that's, we're not going to see a lot of productivity. Yet, that's where Facebook has made social interaction so easy. You know, how many people have you guys probably connected with if you're a Facebook user? There are people I haven't seen for 25 years, and all of a sudden, we're Facebook friends, so we can stalk each other a little bit here and there. So the basic point is, between these two guys, Ryan Gold's and Shirky's arguments, there's a lot of potential wrapped up in our new technologies, 
But until we actually use them, from a persuasive standpoint, they're not terribly useful. So from that perspective, until people actually start using it, we shouldn't consider it as a channel for any particular campaign. So is Facebook used? Absolutely. Are blogs used? Absolutely. Do people go on websites? That's sort of the litmus test for this. And a part of this ability in this new communication age of connecting directly is this potential for people to be empowered. And there's a lot of conversation about how much it means that people can interact directly. They can engage, they can talk to the, the representatives, the companies, to each other. So there's a great deal of empowerment and power in, in just that. You know, let me give you an example. Last year, Aleve launched a, a new campaign. I thought it was personally kind of clever. It sh uh, part of it showed a woman picking up her baby and said, for life's little pains. You know, obviously it's talking about the back pain that you might get because you, you know, people are schlepping their kids around. However, there is a big population of women for whom that, that was an offensive ad. And they let a leave no. Um, there was actually a social media campaign, all connecting with the Leaves blog site, all connecting uh, people's complaints, and there was a big letter writing campaign. And guess what? The CEO of a Leave personally emailed seven to nine hundred people, who, all of whom had sent these letters, and said, "You know what? We're going to we're going to stop this campaign." We didn't intend for it to be offensive, and we're going to do something else. You know, Aleve made the best of it, but think about the power there that people have actually the opportunities to really, to really make a difference. Um, another example of this would be part of the reason that Glenn Beck is no longer on Fox News. Because of his perspective and some of the inflammatory remarks that he's made over the last, let's see, he's been on Fox News about two years or so, people started complaining to the advertisers, saying, we don't want you to advertise on this program. And he lost, uh, there were a lot of the advertisers who, who advertise on Fox where these companies, for example, Verizon, said, okay, you can put us on any program, but do not put us on Glenn Beck. Ultimately, because we live in a commercial media, our commercial news, you know, Fox has to make a profit, MSNBC has to make a profit. That's a big part of why Glenn Beck just signed off the air, you know, in, over the summer of 2011. That's really this power and, and the networking potential associated with people talking back and forth. You know, there's online petitions, there's a lot of things that have emerged where people can actually connect and contribute to things that matter to them. So if we think about it in terms of an equation, democracy, people, and the internet. You know, the old media was about separating us old money, old technology, old news, and it all got filtered down to people. New media is about the interconnections between folks. Now we get to talk to each other to get some information. Now, the great side of this, we, you know, during the protest during the Iranian uh, presidential election and, and shortly after, we saw images being uploaded to YouTube from people's camera phones <clears throat> that we would have never seen five years ago. If a politician does something pretty stupid, let's say Anthony Weiner, it's there in living color because we're connected to one another. This is the reality of today's world. So, so from the good, which is, I would argue, the, the shedding a light on regimes, on practices, on people who need to see the light of day. This is, this is a great opportunity. The negative side, we get a lot of trite crap. 
to be perfectly blunt about it. It's a lot more that we have to filter through. This means that there is even more competition for our attention, more vying for our time, our energy, etc. So we can't avoid this. You know, this internet thing, I think it's going to stick. So we can't avoid it. We are making a digital footprint, but the question is, in terms of a strategy, how can this be used to persuade a target audience? So let's focus on why the Web 2.0 world matters to the people and the application of persuasion. So first, why are campaigners using new media? Very simply, to reach greater numbers. Small businesses, where once they were stuck in whatever town that they were from, can now be global. They can send their stuff to, to the ends, different ends of the earth. This represents an opportunity to reach out and to expand your market base almost exponentially. We have the opportunity to bring more money in to all kinds of sectors, and with that there is a greater opportunity to influence different segments of our society, different cultures, what have you. So you can reach greater numbers with new media. Second, you can really involve supporters. You know, People are fundamentally lazy. This is probably not the most generous description of people, but we are. We are comfortable with point and click. We feel good that we can contribute at the click of a button. So from a social media, social campaign side, for example, trying to raise money for nonprofits, the easier you can make this stuff, the better. The more that you can make people feel like they're a part of the campaign, a part of a solution, by simply pointing and clicking, the more engaged you're getting them into your idea, into your campaign, and the more you could potentially influence their behavior. You know, the fact that hundreds of millions of dollars were raised for Haiti, all with texting. You know, text, text the number and you, you've donated $10. That simple ease helped to involve people. The easier you, as a campaigner that you can make action, the more likely you are to be successful. The simple truth about that. Third, you want to try and engage a younger audience. You know, Facebook, for example, has all of these, all of these ads. And if you take a look at each one of them, they're really showing messaging targeted towards young folks. Now, while older folks are going to be online, if you really want to hit people who are 40, 45 and younger, you better have an online presence. You know, John Stewart from The Daily Show makes fun of Twitter, being online, Facebook, all of that kind of stuff. Yet, here he is. Because his demographic sort of demands that, that he have that online presence. You know, I, I worked for a long time for an advertising company um, dealing with a fairly small niche, but the horse industry in the West. This means, you know, not necessarily the most technology savvy folks, but what we were finding was that our clients who didn't have websites, who didn't have kind of an integrated media approach, they were losing out. They were losing money to, to other people who did. And we're talking horse breeding and a whole lot of other stuff. And the reality was that people wanted to go online. So the younger audience to target online is brilliant, but it's, it's about reaching a lot more people and reaching them in ways that they're using the Internet. This is also a lot cheaper. Frankly, new media is a whole lot less to use than, than advertising in a conventional way. So if you're buying television spots, those are costing you, if you're at the Super Bowl, a couple million bucks for a 30-second ad. Cable, it's a lot cheaper. But if you want to get people your message, you want to try and hit, spend your advertising dollars 
in the ways that can draw more people to you, get more information out. Most campaigns, especially ones that are for social causes, don't have a lot of money. Even commercial campaigns have to be strategic and smart in their media buying, so it's not an un unlimited well. So campaigners are using new media because it's less expensive, you can have more information out there, and it's a resource for people. People want to be able to, to look up on their own, find out what they want to know. Even in case of purchasing behaviors, car manufacturers, for instance, car dealerships, are finding that if they don't have an online presence, they lose sales because people want to feel that sense of empowerment that they know what's going on. They, they have read all about their, the car that they're interested in. They're ready to make a purchase. That's the reality of, of um, both social campaigning and commercial campaigning in today's day and age. It also speeds up the speed of communication. You know, one of the reasons why the newspaper industry is struggling is that that information is 12 to 24 hours old by the time it comes out. Because we have so many avenues to get up-to-the-date information from a wide range of sources, you have to really have that opportunity on demand. So I get in my email Little updates about, about the San Jose Sharks. I get updates from political campaigners, from commercial things. I get the daily update from the Daily Show. All of these kinds of things. Why? Because as it's happening, I get it. I have the RSS feeds on my, on my smartphone. I can look up at any moment's notice what's going on in the world just with my smartphone. Uh, something I just got, by the way, because, again, not an early technology adopter. But all of this means that if us, our campaigns as persuasive tools are not making use of new technology and new media, then we're probably missing out. So these five reasons indicate that social media is impossible to avoid if we want a successful campaign. They offer a lot of benefits. The thing that I find is that most campaigns actually use social media pretty badly. So let's take a look at some of the common pitfalls, pitfalls of online campaigns. The first one is the, the, the field of dreams. If you build it, they will come. One of the most perplexing things about the clients uh, that I mentioned that had websites for their horses is that is this perspective. Uh, we have the website, that's automatically going to turn into new sales. Well, if no one knows that your website exists, guess what, no one's gonna go to it. So it, the silly old adage, if a tree falls in the forest and no one's there to hear it, does it matter? That's the reality, so absent a way to drive people to your website, to your application, to whatever type of social media that you're using, it doesn't really matter if you have that, that tool or not. So while I hate these commercials, a great example of them are the GoDaddy commercials. The whole point to the GoDaddy commercials is to get you to their website. You know, these are clearly targeting guys, you know, at the hope of seeing Danica Patrick's chest somehow revealed on GoDaddy. We can talk about the classiness of that later, but nonetheless. But that's what it's about, is driving people to GoDaddy.com to take a look at their website offerings and so that they can seek more information. What we're seeing is, is a synergy develop between traditional advertising and public relations and social media. You use press releases, advertising, news to drive people to websites, to applications, to Facebook, to Twitter, to get more interaction with them. So that means that you can focus the money that you do spend much more effectively. If you have this, if you build it, they will come philosophy, you will lose. So it's about thinking in the bigger picture there. A second common pitfall related is that 
when we just, you know, we have this tool, we chuck it on because we know we should have a website. We know we should have a Facebook account. I can't tell you how many organizations I see with Facebook accounts who don't actually use them. If these things aren't used, then there's really no point to actually having them. So once we, once we're driving people to the locations, it needs to be all linked together. You know, it, it needs to have a purpose is really the, the core here. You can have a Facebook page, but if you're not engaging people on it, it doesn't matter. Next, we have to also understand the relationship between our target audience and the technology. You know, while I have an 85 year old aunt who uses Facebook, we probably shouldn't rely on social media to target older demographics. Likewise, you know, if we understand that 18 to, to 25 year olds don't typically Twitter that much. They do, they use Facebook, but they may not Twitter. But demographics somewhere 30 to 45 tend to be the folks who t use Twitter the most. So understanding what technologies people use how they use them, and whether they're likely to be comfortable using them gives you a good indication as to how you can integrate technology into a campaign. If you have a campaign targeted at the over 50 crowd, you better be very careful and very limited in how you actually use that technology. And the final common pitfall is that a lot of times people's social media campaign is disconnected from their other campaign activities. So it's important if you have a web page, if you have Facebook, whatever it might be, that the branding and the messaging, the visuals, the verbals, ha are consistent with the rest of your campaign. If you're launching a campaign and you have a website that, you know, you tossed up, someone's uncle tossed it up five years ago, that's not helping the messaging. So understanding that if you can avoid some of these common pitfalls, you're much more likely to design a campaign coherently, strategically. You know, the, the people who are using this, using integrated media technology campaigns the most effectively are people who are sitting down and asking the question, okay, who is our target audience? What, do, what can we expect? How much money do we have? How can we use all of our resources, both paid and owned, most effectively? So let's take a look at some tips for building electronic campaigns. The first component is that you want to build a strong database. This is about knowing your audience and specifically knowing who your audience is. Uh, one of the strongest ways to make virtual campaign successful is to get information out to your key followers. So, you know, in part, this is self-selection. Um, I'm a President Obama supporter. During his 2008 campaign, I signed up for the, the, the newsletters. So that's a start for the database. Now, if I if I recruit people, there's always an option on most of these to say, hey, send our message out to five people you know. I never do, but that's a way to help build the database. Looking at this, this visual here, it's about the network of connections that people have. Starting small and building and, and knowing how you want to build that is a really important part of building an effective virtual campaign or co virtual component of your campaign, knowing your audience. Second, being brief, using brief focused communication. People don't read, I, and, and, I, and I mean this sincerely. If you have a web page that has a thousand words on the opening page, guess what? People are not reading that. Short, concise, and brief. Because, you know, short and brief, two different things. Not really. But you want to keep it focused. 
bullet point style communication because that's all people are reading when they're looking at websites when they're looking for updates posts whatever it is they want to get the gist in a fairly short space you're talking some bullet points and maybe a couple of sentences after each one for more information now you can link to for more information go here and have all of the fully detailed information that you want but as far as the campaign, the basic campaign messaging has to be concise. That's really important. A third tip is that you make it personal. Now this is done with programs and, and tools that just insert people's names out of databases. This doesn't mean you have some poor intern sitting writing John Smith, Maggie Smith, whoever, eight jillion times. And that's the importance in part of the database is that you actually have that. So I mentioned that I get a lot of emails from all of my representatives, no matter what party they come from, and certainly the president, because, you know, I write political letters, I sign up for them, and they have my name. So every single communication that I get from, from those from the places that I shop, um, so politics, social issues, um, commercial issues, I shop a lot online, love the online land, it all has my name. Now I know that Joe Biden is not emailing me personally. I know that it's coming from a program, but guess what, if it has my name in the subject or in the, the opening Dear Audra, I'm more inclined to read it and I know what's going on. The reality is that if you customize, if you personalize messaging using some simple, simple programs, you're much more likely to get people to stop and read it. That's the great thing about a lot of these, a lot of these online tools, is it can be made personal, it can be customized for people in really effective ways without a whole lot of effort and a whole lot of money. Next, it's important to make a conscious decision with your campaigns of how you want to engage people. So what do you want them to be? You know, at the very basic lo level of this ladder, they're spectators. They're listening to your podcasts, they're reading blogs, they're watching generated video. You know, if you're thinking about any of our campaigns that you're building, the food one, the Obama one, the, the nuclear power plant one. A third, you know, half of the people that you, that you try and reach out to probably aren't going to pay attention to you, all right? That's part of, that's part of the challenge of persuasion is that we, we don't get a lot of folks. A third of those then are just going to be spectators. They'll read, they may not do anything else, but they're at least paying attention. The next level up are the people who do the like on Facebook, you know, that, so that they can get the updates. Black Label Society, I get Zach Wilde's updates, you know, a couple of times a week. I'm a joiner. The next level up are the people who use the RSS feeds. They subscribe to them. They get them delivered either on their computers, or on their smartphones, their tablets, whatever it might be. Notice these three levels, they're still not interacting. So this, this great joy of the social media, they're not interacting, they're just stalking. It's at the level of critic and creator that you have people who actually engage. These are the people at the, ver at the least will comment on the blogs or if you read a news story, you can scroll all the way down to the bottom and read the crazy comments that people make. And let's face it, a lot of those comments are a whole lot of crazy. But that's a critic, they're engaging. Their rating things. My mom is very rigorous when she sends her Netflix back in that she rates that Netflix movie. You know, 
and and she uses those ratings too by the way she won't get a video unless it has at least three stars if she doesn't know the if she hasn't seen it before bless her heart but so that's kind of the next level and then the creators these are the people who will take your own your organization's messaging they'll upload videos they'll make their own it's viewer generated content so if you look at it, only 13% of people are really creating new things online. But these are an important set of, of folks. They're, they're, they're the ones that you have active and activated. But the rest of them are equally important because you have to figure out in your campaign where you want to engage folks. If you are trying to get people to shift from being from being inactive, you're not going to get them to create new web content. You're just hoping to get them up to being spectators. This is where the conscious decisions about how your campaign is going to engage your target audience are really critical with when you're building an interactive kind of a campaign. If you know that that a good portion of your target audience is likely to use a social networking site, they're already joiners, then heck, you can try and make them collectors or critics. So think about it in terms of understanding whether they're likely to be already engaged, whether you're even trying to get them over that hump to pay attention. The more effectively that virtual campaigns understand where their target audience is in terms of this ladder, the more realistic the, the measurable objectives are that they can actually set. And then the final tip for e-campaigns is that you need to coordinate the online and the offline actions. This is more than just the branding more than just be making your messaging consistent this is about trying to get people to take action. So I think that this uh, website is actually really kind of interesting. This was used as a way of trying to get the message out and get, get the information out about the new health care reform that, took, that, took, uh, that was passed in 2010. A lot of the problems with this particular piece of reform are that people simply don't understand it. So there was a lot of messaging, commercial advertising, um, work by the administration and supporters of it to get people some basic information and then trying to get them to follow up online. That's the Next To You website. And so the question then is, take the checkup to find how the health reform clicks. What's interesting about this, when I click through it, you know, your mom. It'll ask you some questions and it goes through and, and then it informs you what changes have been made that might affect particular types of demographics. So I use my mom as an example. Um, she's someone who, who, they're small business owners, so they have a lot of challenges. She has pre-existing conditions. Medical care is very expensive for her. So it goes through this whole checkup, and here's the result that you can see the result. Now, what it also does is it gives me the opportunity to tell her, and see the, hi, mom, I just found out, blah, blah, blah. That's not me. That's not what I wrote to my mom. That's a form-filled-in message. So they're making it as easy as possible to not only learn information, but to also share that information. This is a great example of a coordinated effort between online and offline actions. So this is kind of what we're, I want you to think about as you're putting together your campaigns. You know, a lot of times people will just focus on sort of the commercial side of a campaign. Be creative. The more ways that you can engage, and frankly, for, for less money, the more potential reach that your campaign is going to have. So I want to take a look now at a case study in a campaign. Um, the 2008 presidential election was revolutionary because of the way that 
that then candidate Obama used social media to build his campaign. Now, this isn't about the politics. This isn't, I don't, this isn't about whether we like the president or not, whether we like his policies or not. What's interesting about his particular campaign is that it gives a model that's being used right now for other political campaigns, for social campaigns, for commercial campaigns, because it was revolutionary in the ways that it used social networks to promote what, to promote what they were selling. In this case, the election of President Obama. So what can we learn? If we, if we understand this campaign, we can use it as our model for making some strategic decisions about how to engage people using social media. And to put this into perspective, he reinvented, President Obama reinvented campaign finance. Five dollars at a time, you know? If we take a look here at the individual contributions of less than $200, in 2008, 2004, and 2000, campaign finance was about big donors. Big donors, big money. Now, the folks behind the president's campaign argued that this didn't engage people, that it didn't get people active in following and following and, and it actually drove down voter participation. The reality is that if you donate $5, you're much more likely to go vote than someone who doesn't. If you donate $5, you're more likely to watch the news. You're more likely to go to the websites. You're more likely to do things. So Obama not only raised $122 million based on fairly small contributions, but this is in large part why we saw an increased youth voter turnout, an increased turnout for ethnic minorities, both demographics that typically have very low voter turnout. By using an effective social media campaign, he got people engaged. So let's take a look basically at the screenshot from his website. There's some messaging, the organ, the blog down below, and there's a lot of blah, blah, blah. But take a look at how this is laid out. You, there's a thousand ways to click. Okay, that might be an overstatement. But there's an opportunity to get mail, email updates at the upper right. Moving down below that, if you already do, you can log in. You can join local groups, blogs, find events, fundraise. All of those are separate links, separate things that you can do. So in a single screenshot, look at how many ways that his website is trying to engage people who are visiting it. Now, this is what was posted after the campaign, but this gives you an idea about what an, a social media campaign is about. This is about getting people engaged, interacting, and feeling like they have some kind of ownership about it. So if we kind of take a look at the, the underbelly of the campaign, you know, this was a campaign designed by and for young people. So if we look at, at Chris Hughes, this, this was the brains behind the uh, campaign itself. He built a community of people supporting the president or the candidate at the time. This is pretty, pretty ingenious. Using his, Obama's website, two million people created profiles. There are 200,000 actual events, 35,000 volunteer groups, $30 million raised on, on just 70,000 people's independent fundraising pages, people who were raising money to donate to the Obama campaign, 400,000 blog posts. This is crazy. This is, this is engagement all across the country. Why did he win the election? It's because he made people care. 
You know, no matter whether we like what he's selling, we think he's done a good job, he engaged people. The plain and simple truth was that he made people feel like they were a part of that campaign. That's why he won. From this, you know, if we look at these 400,000 blog posts, people's fundraising pages and the volunteer groups, we start to understand that the power behind a social media campaign, the real power is when it goes viral. There are some researchers who argue that a social media campaign isn't successful unless it does go viral. So what, is, what does it mean to go viral? Very simply, it's about user-generated content. So if the only message out there is yours, and this can be commercial, political, social, it doesn't matter, then you're probably not terribly successful. As soon as people start taking your message, uploading their own user-generated content, that's when you know you're starting to have a successful campaign. So the true test of any campaign success, for your evaluation sections, by the way, if you use a virtual campaign, is that people are engaged. So let's take a look at some use examples of user-generated content from the Obama campaign. The number of Obama photos uploaded on Flickr, 660,000. These are not from the campaign, but uploaded by people who, who just wanted to post them. Whoops. There's 495,000 Obama videos posted on YouTube. People who made their own videos along with some of the campaign videos. Mostly these are user generated. On Etsy.com, which is kind of a, um, an artsy eBay kind of thing, 2,700 different things that you can sell based on the Obama campaign. You could buy the Yes We Can pendant, the, the, any of the images there. These are all things, it's kind of like Cafe Press, if you're familiar with it. This is what tells the message that you're trying to get out there. To the extent that people are developing these campaigns effectively, the users in a social media campaign are taking them and running with them. They're making them their own. So this is why it's complex, but this is also what's the interesting potential with it, is because you have all of this user-generated content, you have your own content, and you also have a competitive media environment. So you have people with the explosion of social media blogging. You have people with disparate viewpoints trying to connect together. It is essentially the wild west of messaging. This is what makes it hard is because it's hard to give up control and it's also hard for your organization to get its voice heard over and above everything else. That's why going viral, relying on user generated content is a better measure of whether or not your campaign is successful. If people are uh, borrowing the hope and change, your branding is doing its job. So let's take a picture of our social media, and this is, you know, circa 2009, 2010. There's even more. This gives you a, a basic idea of the crazy, wacky world of social media. All of these options. So what should the campaign do? What potential social media options should you be using? That's what's tough. That's figuring that out is actually hard. You cannot do it all. It's not practical. So I would say that the camp Obama campaign offers us three criteria in your campaign building that helps us decide what you want to do with your campaign. Remember, keep in mind that ladder of engagement that we talked about a few minutes ago. The modern social media campaign is about three concepts, making the campaign personal, social, and advocacy. So let's start with the first part about this, making it personal. 
personal. Your campaign materials have to be accessible. You have to go where people are, have multiple ways that they can interact with you, and multiple ways of patronizing you, you know, ease of donation, things like that. So, a lot of the advertising that's going on right now is being done through applications. Companies are building applications for other companies. The app's free, but it's about getting people where they live. There's a website, the Facebook, and then you can check it out wherever they are. If you have, if your message isn't getting out to people in the places they're using where your target audience actually is, it's not accessible. People aren't going to pay attention to it. So if you take a look at this Obama Everywhere list, that's a lot of different places that the Obama campaign had an official side at. That's not everywhere, though. So the idea is, at the first level, this is getting people from being inactive up to engaged and paying attention. You have to reach out to them. You have to have a lot of different, a lot of different touch points. That's, you know, having the website, Facebook, an app, things like that, multiple touch points. And you have to make it easy for them to get involved. Remember, we're fundamentally lazy. Make it easy, hit the easy button, and you have your first step. Now, this is the basic level. The second level is making it social. Your materials need to be shareable. So, if you've done a good job with the visuals, which we'll talk about in the next week or two, you can let people take them and use them in a whole lot of different ways. So for instance, one of the things that Obama did was let you download icons, logos, signs, kind of everything, and then have the foresight to not try and control what people did with it. That means letting people run amok sometimes. You're not going to like everything they do with your materials, but you can't have a campaign that goes viral unless you give up control. So making it easier for people to use your logos, adapt them a little bit, almost guarantees that if people are interested in the message that you have, it's going to be used much more broadly and much more effectively than you did to begin with. So it's making it social. It's, it's making Facebook links so that people can cross post so that people can, can get the information to their friends that they want to share it with. We are fundamentally social creatures and good social media is social. And then the last stage, you know, getting people to be critics and even creators is about being advocates, empowering people to take action. So you make volunteering really easy. You know, I, I get a lot of emails, will you host a potluck or come to this particular, uh, there's a, there's a, an election party in Poughkeepsie on Saturday night. Can you make it? That's a really smart set of tools. Creating mobile alerts, getting text messages. Heck, Domino's will text message you anytime they have a sale or a coupon. You can get a virtual coupon these days. So engaging people in a lot of different ways and trying to get them, trying to ask them to perform a particular behavior, social media campaigns make it easy for people. That's the whole idea. See, you're going to lose people at each of these stages. You're not going to get everyone into that first stage, the, the personal stage where it's accessible. You're going to lose some who aren't going to share anything. And you're also going to lose some who don't want to engage. But if you have a good campaign that gets the messages out and is accessible, it gives people an opportunity to engage. Here's really the take home. Social media is just a tool. 
if it makes sense for your target audience, and if it makes sense for the nature of your campaign, this gives you some clues and some tips and some tricks about using it. If we're going to be effective with persuasion, it's not about a one-way message, beating home your idea until it bleeds. It's about engagement today. Persuasion isn't about telling people, it's about building community. That, I think, is the biggest difference between 15 years ago and today. If we're not engaging people where they live, we're less likely to be effective. This is both in terms of the type of message that we send and certainly the channels that we use. All right, have a good one all.